to this live uh, Q&A session for day two of this course. If you have any questions, you can again type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask me questions. So uh, today we'll go over some of the neural networks and we'll see how to uh, change uh, things in the neural network for classification problems. Most of the les lessons that we looked at in this course were the regression problem. And we'll also look at some, some intricate details on, uh, uh, on the model itself. So for today, let me start with uh, uh, the neural network. And uh, today I will be using the, uh, the first neural network that uh, we trained in this, uh, in this course. So I have uh, the code over here. You can just click on this link and that takes us to this code, which is for uh, a regression model. But we'll change things in this regression model. And instead of using a QM9 data set, which is for regression, uh, we would uh, use the BBBP, the blood brain barrier data set, which is, a, which is for classification and see how we can modify this code uh, to, to do classification. So let's first install these packages as, uh, as we would need uh, similar things because we are looking at a molecular data set and we would need to featureize them and uh, we would also need to split the data. So while this is being installed, uh, let's change the code in in the data or the, the URL over here. So instead of QM9 data set, today we would be using BBBP data set. And this is the same data set that uh, was in the exercise for classical machine learning models. And you can find this on the MoleculeNet uh, data set website. So we, let's see, it's installing let it install and the data set uh, the target value for the data set is uh, has has the column name pnp so let's replace gap with pnp and let, let's just look at one percent of the data set yeah. In, installing fastml that code is running and it finished so we'll run this one so we have the data set. So let's just look at the data set to make sure that we have the right data set. Yeah. So we have smiles, uh, PNP, smiles and other things. This is good. But before proceeding further, I remember that this data set had some uh, not, not good data and the smiles were not right. So we need to clean up that before proceeding. So let's uh, clean it up with uh, converting it to into a, a molecule object uh, from uh, our decade and then removing it as we did in, in the session, uh, in the Q&A session yesterday. So we'll import, uh, uh, we'll import Panda tools. Pandas tools, I think, yeah. So we'll import pandas tools from rdkit.chem, import pandas tools. And let's see, let's import this first. And once we have that, we'll use the pandas tools dot add. add molecule to column and we'll pass in the data set and we need the smiles column name which is smiles and then we need uh, the name of the molecule uh, column that will that will create which would be molecule and uh, let's look at the data set again once it is created and this should have uh, the data set with molecules created and this is all good right now with, with the molecules over here. 
And remember, some of the molecules were not created yesterday because the smiles are not good. We need to drop them. So we'll use the drop uh, any uh, code, the drop any function that we had. So let's make the data set. Uh, data set is equal to data set dot develop any and if you look at this we have 205 rows because we only use 10 percent of the data set mm -hmm. and uh, if if in case uh, there are some missing entries we just want to be sure that we just remove all of the missing entries in here and just to make uh we can just keep it here or then we just use smiles and p and p so this i do because i don't want this molecule object again uh, i generated this molecule object just to make sure that uh, we have the right uh, right data or clean data once we have that it's all good and from this point on we i can just proceed with the code for neural networks but in this case, we are uh, doing a classification yeah. problem and not a regression problem. So we'll use the circular uh, feature visors. We have the smiles, uh, fingerprints, fingerprints, all is good. But instead of gap, we are using the PNP. <clears throat> and let's feature visor it. We can change the radius and the size, but in, in this demonstration, we <clears throat> will just stick with uh, the, the code that we have here. And then we'll split it. The target here again is not gap, it's P and P. Oh. So once we do this, we'll look at the data set again to make sure we have the right things. The test looks okay, a list of all, uh, all those values. And let's look at Y too. And hopefully I get this working. So it's ones and zeros, ones and zeros. So this is all uh, looking good as, as far as the data set is concerned. Uh, now we'll do the data loader. Again, data loader is something that we need to use to control the amount of data that we put in to a machine learning model in case of PyTorch. And this helps to control how much data we put in by controlling the batch size. And we have the X values, the Y values put in here, and the X values us are the fingerprints, Y values are the ones and zeros instead of uh, a single uh, float number. So we need to do some classification. So we'll just run the collate function, which is telling us given a, a batch of data, a group of data, how do we batch it together and pass it to the neural network for training. So we are just going to stack all the X values and Y values and uh, do the training. But there are some things that we need to change at this point, which is the X values. If you look at the X values, let's, uh, sorry, the Y values. So the Y values are just ones and zeros, and we need to do classification. So what is usually done in, uh, in these kind of uh, classification problems is you, you need to put in one hot encoding for these, uh, uh, predictions, uh, the target values. Instead of one, we'll have a one hot encoding for one. And what it looks like is it will be zeros and ones with the, the first place being zero and the second place of the vector being one. And that's because one we are looking at. But if it's zero, there will be one on the first place. I'll show you what it looks like. And we have these test values over here. Let's put in uh let's make it into a uh, one hot encoding so pd dot get dummies and then if we pass in y test this should give us zeros and ones and let's look at first uh, one or two entries so one two three four four entries are one and fifth entry is zero 
So what we should expect is all four entries, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four entries have one in the second place. And these are zero, 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 zeros. So this is how we get one hot encoding. This represents the, uh, the target is one. This is one, one, one. This is zero, 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 and so on. So this is class zero or class one. So this is something pretty uh, handy to use. So we try to always transform the Y values uh, to, to a one hot encoding. So the question here is uh, what, what difference that it, what difference does it make? It's already in binary. It's already in binary. So what we, what we want over here is to make a one hot encoding type thing. And that helps you in predictions as you, as you would see later on, because our learning, our model that we are going to use is not going to predict zeros and ones. It's going to predict a float value. It can be anywhere between zero and one. So how do we know whether it's zero or one? So the, the way to do it is you can uh, have something called a sigmoid function or a 10 hyperbolic function which will uh, of a soft max function at the end of the layer so that it becomes zero or one. But uh, if you don't want to do that, what we usually end up doing is we get an array of prediction. So we'll get some value over here, maybe 0 0.2 and 0 0.7 for the other one. And then we just max it and see which one has the maximum value. That's what we are going to do. And it will tell whether it's the first one that has the maximum value or the second one that has the maximum value. And if the second one has the maximum value, your predicted class is class two, and that's act in actor. And though this is binary, this approach is, uh, helps you with some less of a coding. And also if you have more classes, maybe we are not limited to two classes. You have three or four classes you can still use uh, this way of getting dummies and doing the classification. You need not uh, change any of the code that I'm showing over here to do the classification. And I, I hope that helps. So we'll, we'll have to do th this on all the uh, data set, all of the uh, values, the Y values. And you see the distribution. This is what the distribution right now looks like. So we'll do this uh, in, in the code for data load over here. So the changes that we need to do is pd.getDummies. And we pass in the Y values. Uh, and once we have the Y values, we need to get a array of that and uh, so similar to the top ones, fp.values, we'll do values over here. And rest of the thing remains same. So values, values, if you look at what values gives us. So this is pd.dummies. And if you take values for this, it's going to give us an array of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0, so on and so forth. So that's what we would be getting like this. So we want this type of arrangement and then we'll convert this into a list instead of, of an array. And that's what this code over here does, pd.getDummies and uh, we have the Y. So once uh, we do this, we'll do it for the Y values, the validation ones too. And a valid dot values and pg.dummies and then dot values Oops. and uh, once this is okay so well, i've the one the top code i think let's run it again okay so once i run it let's look at the first data or uh, first entry in the tra uh, training data loader we see that we have zero and one now so this is class uh, you say active or not uh, not active or active, this is active. And these are the fingerprints that we have on top. So it works, we get the data set in the order. And now here the things change. So 
if you look at the uh, train data loader, we have zero and one. So now we are predicting two things and not just one. And we, we would then need to change the code over here. So instead of predicting one task, giving us one output, we need two outputs. And we can even do this for regression tasks where you have multiple things to predict. So for, for instance, you are predicting the homodomo gap, you're predicting the total energy. You can do the same thing for, uh, for that. And in that case, instead of zero and one, maybe the first value is homodomo gap, the second value is energy. So that, that's called multi uh, multi label regression or multi label classification. And this one is multi label classification for us. So we have two uh, as the output, and the model is essentially the same and with two output features. And we do have some time. So I'll just. Uh, so I'll just explain a little bit of what these things are. You, uh, so a dropout is, uh, is a way to uh, not overfit the model. So you have a lot of neurons in a uh, neural network. What a dropout does is it turns off some of the neurons so that we don't overfit uh, the data. And P equal to zero means no, no, none of the neurons are turned off. And P equal to one means all the neurons are turned off. So this value ranges between zero and one. And uh, based on that, you prevent overfitting of the model. So if you think that uh, your data is overfitted, you can increase the dropout. If not, it's zero is okay. And the way you would determine whether your model is overfitting the, the data or not is when you look at your training loss and your validation loss. If your training loss and validation loss have a large gap in them, that means you are overfitting uh, to the training. You are overfitting it to the training. And if the loss between the validation and the test, uh, validation and the training is small, that means your model is pretty good. It's not bad. And when the difference is large, it means that overfitting. So you would need to use something like dropout to do it. Batch normalization is uh, something uh, that helps to keep the values to a normal distribution. Sometimes when they pass through a, a one layer of neuron, the next layer may not get a pretty normal kind of distribution. So batch normalization does normalize the output. And this thing acts differently when it's in training mode and testing mode. That's why we need to specify model.train while training and model.eval while uh, testing or making predictions. And this is a little bit details of what these layers actually mean. And linear layer is just a linear layer with weights and value is the activation, the nonlinear part of it. So there's a question. If we have uh, the fingerprint of size 100, then the input should all the input feature should be 100 as well, right? Yes. So this input feature depends on your size of the input uh, that you're giving, the feature visor input. And in this case, we are using 100 because we set the, the length of the, the vector to be 100, the length of the Morgan's fingerprint vector to be 100. And if it's 200, 300, you would need to change this value to match that value. So let's move forward with uh, this. We have that function. The thing that changes for classification is the loss function also. So instead of mean square error loss, you're having different classes and you're making sure that classes match. So the class that is used is now called cross entropy. Let's see, cross entropy loss. And uh, this is one thing that you would need to change because we don't have any continuous values anymore. We are looking at different classes. But if you are looking at a regression problem with multiple classes, because it's a regression problem, you will be still using mean square error loss or MSE loss. But because this is classification, uh, the function for classification. 
classification is uh, Tavas entropy. Change this. And this is also the same. And the, the optimizer is that's why. Right. And you should essentially be able to train it. Let's see. Hopefully, this doesn't give any errors. It was pretty quick. And over here, you see that the difference between those two was not large. And this means the model is not overfitting. Over here, you see a little bit of overfitting because the loss over here is large, uh, smaller than this, overfitting issues. And you see over here, the loss is a lot more uh, for validation and less for the uh, training. So in this case, we would need to use drop out or some other methods to, uh, to reduce this uh, overfitting. Okay. So, uh, the rest of it is pretty much same as before. You can look at the sample and, oh, okay. I don't have those many samples in here. So the prediction for 15 sample is one, and that means it should be uh, the second value of it. So let's see what this predicts. And you see, we predict two values as before. And if you were to do the uh, single value, whether it's zero or one, it would have been difficult to determine what it would be. But what is usually done in this case is once you predict it, you uh, find the maximum value in this tensor and that is over here. And that means it's class one. So what there's another code that you can do is let me call this thing as prediction. prediction is equal to this. And what people usually look at is not the prediction value itself, but our max of that. And that gives you one. So it tells you it's class one. And you can uh, do something like the oops, prediction dot item. Yeah. So in this case, you would have to uh, convert zeros or ones and match the zeros or ones here or change this code a little bit so that it gets a, a, an, a tensor. But uh, this is how over here you would look at uh, classification problems. And if you have maybe 10 classes uh, and the predicted class is nine, so it'll uh, put out a tensor nine, and that means the ninth class is uh, what what the prediction is, and if it matches, it matches good. You would need to change, make some changes here, which is predict items is uh, a tensor and cannot be converted into a scalar. <clears throat> you can just remove prediction, and then that should work. So, so this is uh, about classification problem. And this is how you do classification with uh, any neural network. You can do that, do this even with graph neural networks, make sure you change your entropy and change your labels so that uh, you have multiple classes. And the code should remain essentially the same for regression or, or, or classification, the training part at least. Uh, you can even use the predictions that we have over here. So uh, how to, we, we can't use mean absolute error or R2 score for doing this, but we can essentially look at something called confusion matrix. And uh, what, what you need to give it is the X and Y values. So the predicted, uh, let me go scroll a little bit down. So form prediction. So if you use something like form predictions, so you can pass in the predicted values and the test values into the confusion matrix, and it will give you a confusion matrix. So this is the predicted value and the true value. So this is two positives. So the true label was zero. It was predicted to be zero. 
and 12 of them do that and predicted value is one the true value is one that's here and predicted value is zero but true value is one and all of that so this is what you would look at into uh, into this uh, how evaluating the predictions so there's one question why is the value of class uh, zero negative uh, if we are using value as an activation function at the end. So I don't think we are using a value as an activation function. The last layer is a linear layer and uh, the linear layer is what is making the prediction. So the linear layer over here can be uh, anything. So it depends on what this wants to output. And for that case, what, what we usually end up doing is you can add a layer on top of this which is called a softmax layer. And uh, what, what that would do is you can still keep the tasks as one and that is going to predict zero or one, but you can, you can do that later with argmax too. So you can use the same code and even if it's uh, a negative value, it's okay. Mm, I hope that clears it, okay. And uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, Q&A for, uh, for day two. And we, I hope to see you uh, tomorrow for day three Q&A. Until then, have a good rest of your day.